to hudsonlibrary.org to sign up. Quick little thank you to the Learned Owl. They'll be providing copies of this book here tonight, The First Kennedys. So there'll be a link on the right-hand side, and you can click on that and support our local bookseller and get a copy of that wonderful book. We'll have time for questions at the very end of the program. So at the very bottom, you'll see a Q&A. Put your questions in there, and then we can ask them to our author. So speaking of our author, we have Neil Thompson, and he's going to be talking about this book here, The First Kennedys. A little bit about his background. He has a BA in English Journalism Communications from the University of Scranton. As a journalist, he's written for some of these uh, wonderful things, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, Outside, Esquire, Backpack, Vanity Fair, and Wall Street Journal. His previous books include Kickflip Boys, The Curious Man, The Strange and Brilliant Life of Robert Ripley, Driving with the Devil, Light This Candle, The Life and Times of Alan Shepard, Hurricane Season, and he's coming from Seattle, Washington, so I'll turn it over to you. Derek, thank you. Thanks for the kind intro, and thank you to uh, Hudson Library and the Historical Society for um, uh, for putting this thing together and for hosting me and for being such gracious uh, supporters of this book and of all books. Um, thank you to the booksellers, too, who are helping out tonight. Um, and I look forward to uh, our conversation in a minute here, Derek. And then uh, I would love for you guys to throw questions my way. I, I really thrive on that. I think it's fun to hear what people are thinking about uh, history and about, in this case, the Kennedys and about Irish immigration. So um, a little bit further along, let's uh, go ahead and um, uh, tackle your questions um, and we'll leave you know at least 20, if not more uh, minutes uh, toward the end of the program for that. Um, so um, don't be shy, ask me anything, seriously. <laughs> Um, so I guess I'll just start uh, briefly with a little overview of this book, and then I wanted to read a few pages. Uh, the book is called The First Kennedys, The Humble Roots of an American Dynasty. Um, and uh, it's my attempt to tell the backstory or the origin story of the, uh, the Kennedys, um, to go back to the beginning days of the first Kennedys who came to America in the mid-1800s. Uh, their names are Bridget and Patrick, who I focus on in the first chapters of this book. Um, Irish immigrants, refugees, really escaping from the potato famine that was ravaging their country at that time. Um, but it's really also an exploration of immigration as a whole <clears throat> across time in America and, uh, and a look at the, the intense <laughs> vitriolic hatred and discrimination that the Kennedys and other Irish immigrants of their day faced in, in trying to start a new life for themselves here in America. Um, the kinds of uh, forces that they confronted or the same forces that confronted every subsequent and previous uh, uh, generation of, of immigrants, no matter where they came from. Um, uh, but in the case of the Kennedys, uh, what, what struck me and got me interested in this story in the, in the very beginning was the fact that you know, we think of the Kennedys as this family of wealth and power um, and style and and all these other things, you know, JFK and Jackie O and, and uh, you know, this beautiful family um, and all they represent to us as a country. You know, they're our royal family to many people, uh, America's royal family, the, the saga and the legacy of Camelot and all that. But really, it all started with just a couple of dirt poor, uh, despised immigrants uh, uh, trying to work their way up from the lowest level jobs. Um, so I'm just going to read um, uh, a few pages from the very beginning of the book to give you a, a, a taste of the story and a little introduction to um, a couple of the characters. And then I think uh, Derek and I are going to talk for a few minutes after that, and then we can uh, start to take your questions. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Let me find my spot here and read a few pages. While I'm looking, this book came out uh, just February of this year. Um, it took me many years to uh, write, two years full time, but uh, at a couple of decades before that of fits and starts and trying to figure out what the story really was. Um, and I, I, I didn't really find the story until I found Bridget, who I'm gonna read to you uh, about right now. Bridget Murphy Kennedy is burying her husband today. Boston doesn't want his Irish Catholic body in its soil, so she'll need to leave the city, 
travel west to the Catholic cemetery in Cambridge again. Uh, I just want to add, this is from the prologue, November 23rd, 1858. Patrick died at home yesterday after a slow surrender to tuberculosis, then known as consumption, a disease that consumed the body. Patrick Kennedy was 35 years old. They'd been married nine years, having found each other after their respective escapes from a starving island. They'd had five children, buried one. They'd moved often from cramped tenement to back alley apartment, surrounded by more people in one block than they'd have seen in a month back on their farms in Ireland. Their entire world was now within walking distance of the docks where they'd landed, the docks where Patrick kept working until he couldn't. With no Catholic cemetery in East Boston and only one in all of Boston, he'd have to be interred miles west at Cambridge Catholic Cemetery, one of the only local burial sites available for their kind. Protestant Boston had done what it could to contain the Irish, to corral the spread of their evil popery. Preventing Irish funerals and burials had been a long running goal of old school Boston, whose Yanks didn't want the Irish walking their streets, spreading their sickness, their bad manners and their religion. It's no easy commute to Cambridge from the island of East Boston, especially with four young kids in tow. The hours long journey requires two, two water crossings. It's a journey Bridget made three years earlier to bury her third child, her firstborn son. John Francis Kennedy's brief life was hardly unique in its brevity. Irish immigrants kids weren't expected to live past age five, a dismal survival rate. John had reached 20 months before an intestinal disorder known as cholera and phantom <clears throat> or summer diarrhea took him along with scores of other poor Irish kids that summer of 1855 when six in 10 Boston deaths were children under the age of five. Consumption and cholera, typhus and smallpox, the fevers and diseases of the immigrant slums stalked Boston's air and water, flaring up like hot spots in a wildfire. Her daughters have so far beaten the odds. Mary is now seven, Joanna four days shy from her sixth birthday, Margaret three, and in Bridget's arms is the youngest Kennedy, another son named for his father, Patrick Joseph. Patrick Joseph, 10 months old. They call him PJ. Mass was held early that day at East Boston's Church of the Most Holy Redeemer. The pastor, James Fitton, offered a few kind words about Patrick, his work at the shipyards where he made barrels. The death of Patrick Kennedy are no mention in the papers, just another dead patty among tens of thousands who'd been pouring into Boston and Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, and New Orleans over the past decade. It's a brittle cold Tuesday with snow in the air as they start to make their way to the graveyard. A horse-drawn hearse carries the coffin, followed by carriages with Bridget and her children, then mourners on foot, a slow procession beyond Boston's city limits, a common sight. The question has persisted for more than 20 years, where to put dead immigrants in a city that doesn't want Irish or Catholics in its soil. City officials have passed laws and statutes to prevent Catholics from burying their dead in the mostly Protestant city. The city's lone Roman Catholic cemetery, St. Augustine Cemetery in South Boston has been full for years. There's Bunker Hill Cemetery in nearby Charleston, home of the infamous convent burning, whose town leaders rejected an incoming ship full of famine Irish and generally shared the sentiments of their newspaper editor, William Wielden, who said, our country is literally being overrun with the miserable, wretched, vicious, and unclean paupers of the old country. They're not only introducing their wretchedness and disease among us, but if they ever recover from these plagues, they have a worse disease, which will overspread this country, their religion. So not Charleston, Cambridge it would be. The decision had in, in fact been made three years earlier. A day after little John's death, Patrick had found a family plot there and paid $6 for it, a grim investment, hoping he and Bridget wouldn't need it again soon. John was the first Kennedy buried in the new world, the first not to be sunk into Irish turf. As his own death neared, Patrick was perhaps comforted to know he'd be lowered into the same American ground to rest beside his son. His wife and children watch as the dirt covers his box. With Patrick underground, Bridget and the others retrace their steps back to East Boston. This is not the legacy she dreamed of on the deck of the ship that carried her here. She'll have to write to Patrick's parents back in Dungan'stown and to her own family in nearby Cluna. Had it all been a mistake, thinking she could start a full new life in America? She has no choice now but to return to the job she took on when she'd arrived 10 years earlier. She'll go back to serving others, a domestic, <clears throat> a biddy, a maid. 
Her husband's death might have sparked a tipping point into a tragic descent into a lifetime as an overworked maid, watching as her daughters became servants too, and her son an underpaid dock worker, all of them destined to die young and poor among the reviled hordes of refugees. Instead, in a remarkable display of drive and resilience, over the next decade, Bridget will march from strength to strength. She'll become a proper wage earner, an entrepreneur, and even a landlord, at a time when most women needed a husband's permission and a special license to open a business. She'll learn to sell things. She'll provide other immigrants with the supplies they need, flour, tea, milk, liquor. She'll develop skills to pass on to her son. She'll loan him money to launch his career, which in time will make him one of the wealthiest and most influential men on the island of East Boston. And by the end of her life, she'll be recognized as a woman of many noble and charitable traits. But first, before all this, there came the irrevocable decision to cross an ocean, to escape toward the potentially grim unknown. Um, so that's essentially how the book opens uh, with Bridget and the Kennedy family at, at this very low point, uh, a point at which the family could have ceased to be. Uh, and and uh, the story from that point forward tracks what I believe is Bridget's remarkable ascent to uh, success and respectability, keeping her family together, becoming a small business owner and, and putting her, her children, uh, particularly in this case, her son, PJ, on a path toward their own successes, which in turn will give us the Kennedys that we know of today. So, Derek, I'm not hearing you. Hey, Derek. Derek, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me? You're you're on mute though. It looks like you're on mute. No. Huh. Okay. <laughs> huh. The little symbol uh, on your on your video image says uh, the uh, that you're muted. <clears throat> Hmm. I hope it's not on my end. Let me try something. I'm trying. I, I'm just not hearing you. <clears throat> Sorry, everybody. Um, so, Derek, are you, were you able to hear me that that reading in the beginning? I hope. Yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> not sure why I'm not hearing you, um, but uh, let's pivot and um, maybe Q and A in the chat or the Q and A box, or I can just talk a little bit more about the book. There's a couple Q and A questions. Okay, yeah, it looks like others are having a hard time hearing you as well. Um, but let, let me just uh, for a minute while, while we're figuring that out, um, uh, just uh, make another couple of comments about the book um, and, 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 and see if that helps uh, jar loose a, a couple of other questions. Um, you know, my, my hope here, as I mentioned, was, um, you know, bring to life this this uh, uh, deeper history of the family and, and go back and show what what life was like for them uh, and, and what life was like for many other Irish immigrants during that period of time. Um, and, and also to give credit, you know, I read this little section for Bridget because I really wanted to give credit to her as kind of this forgotten and overlooked figure in the in the history of this family and 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 bring to life uh, her ascent and, and show that she, she played this important but forgotten role um, in, in the story of this family that, who's, you know, the history is very male dominated as, as many of us may know. Um, uh, you know, a lot of credit goes to JFK's father, Joe Kennedy, uh, for basically being as, as he's been called, the patriarch of that entire family. Um, and it really went out of my way not to, necessarily debunk the story of Joe Kennedy and his role in um, 
bringing that family to, to wealth and political power, but to add some nuance and context to it and show that Joe was a wealthy kid uh, and, and he came from uh, a family that had already succeeded uh, against remarkable odds and, um, and uh, sh you know, sh bring to life the, those overlooked characters who without whom um, Joe Kennedy wouldn't have had any of his successes. Derek, I hear shuffling of papers, so I think you Okay, think that's a good sign. Then you, you can hear me now? <laughs> I can hear I you, yeah. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So I'll start with actually one of the things I found most interesting about this. So I have an archives background, public history. And to me, this reads, even though it has a little thing on the side, biography. Well, <laughs> anyways, it, it doesn't read like a biography. It reads in a lot of ways like a scavenger hunt because PJ, towards the end of his life, wrote, obviously, because he was a businessman. The beginning of his life, not so much. Bridget really didn't write anything. So how did you construct that story between Bridget and then she handed off her story to her son, PJ? Yeah, that's a good question. And and I'll, I'll add to my answer. One of the uh, Q&A questioners asked when Bridget died. Bridget died in uh, 1888 <clears throat> um, when her son, PJ, was 30 years old. Um, and she died at a time when PJ was just beginning to experience his own success. He, you know, raised a fatherless kid on the streets of East Boston, um, got into trouble as a young man, didn't have much schooling, worked on the docks of East Boston as a longshoreman, and then found his way uh, into saloons uh, and became a successful saloon keeper and a liquor retail dealer and a liquor wholesaler. <laughs> all of which led him in time to, into politics. He became immensely successful at that time. You know, an Irish, you know, American-born son of uh, Irish immigrant widow uh, who was running for election up against old school Brahmin families and, and mainly Republicans. He was part of this sort of upstart wave of Irish democratic politicians just gaining agency for themselves. Um, but to your question, um, you know, thankfully, uh, once PJ achieved some success, he did leave behind a paper trail that I was able to follow. Um, you know, uh, legislative documents and newspaper articles, and thankfully was able to access uh, the what are known as the PJ Kennedy Papers at the John F. Kennedy Library outside of Boston. Um, personal letters, business letters, business documents that PJ left behind um, that have were fi finally digitized uh, toward the end of my research on this book and, and helped give me some insights into his character, showing what a you know, a, a generous and gracious and kind of caring soul he was. Uh, I, I think some of it tracing back to his mother, Bridget, who was known to help neighbors and family and friends. Uh, uh, and it really helped me bring to PJ to life. But but Derek, you're right. The, some of the other aspects of my research really were a scavenger hunt. Uh, you know, Bridget and Patrick, the first to, to come here, didn't leave behind collected papers. They were poor immigrants. Patrick died young. Um, so there, and I try and be honest about this in the book, I tell you what I know, and I tell you what I don't know, but I really worked hard to make this a readable, um, story. Um, and I, and I attempted to do so by bringing to life characters on either side of Bridget and Patrick, you know, showing what life was like for other immigrant Irish maids like Bridget, for other immigrant Irish, uh, barrel makers like Patrick, um, you know, and and um, as well as showing what the journey was like to America on these dangerous coffin ships, what it was like to be confronted by, you know, gangs of thugs who were, you know, throwing bricks at Irish homes and t threatening to tear down their churches and, you know, shrieking to send them back, go back to where you came from, these kinds of attitudes that they were up against. Um, but, uh, but, but, yeah, the PJ Kennedy papers were very helpful, um, and uh, having that access to that at my fingertips was remarkable. As as was reading, as I did every day for more than a year, newspaper articles from the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, having access to that was a remarkable uh, help for my um, uh, for my research. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. It's nice having things at your fingertips. <laughs> I was just going to ask, how did you do some of the research with, you know, the lockdowns and COVID with everything digitized? Did you still have to call in favors to get 
things scanned or read to you or anything oh, like that? I begged, borrowed, stole, you name it, um, <laughs> cajoled, uh, pleaded. You, uh, but I, in fact, I just wrote a story for a, a, a great website called LitHub, lithub.com, I think it is, not org, um, about the research process for this book because I... I started on it many years ago. I traveled to Ireland way back in 2006, did some archival research there and some uh, mounds of photocopying at the time um, and would do bits of research every couple of years and then would pull back and move on to another project. So I had a lot of research already. Um, and then sort of 2018, 19, I committed myself to the project full time and traveled to Boston and, and did more in-person research. But then toward the very end, I was, I was locked out. You know, the JFK library closed, all the archives in Boston closed. Everything I needed access to was, was done. And most of what I needed, but I still, for that final stretch, needed to get creative. And I've discovered that there's just way more than I ever realized online. Um, I mentioned newspapers.com, but there's also... You know, these are library folks, so you guys might know some of this. Ancestry.com, MyHeritage.com, FamilySearch.com. Some of these might be .org, but, you know, the National Archives online, uh, you know, the archives of numerous other, um, you know, library collections, uh, many of which have been digitized. So it's... I, I, and I write in the story, I missed going to libraries. I missed meeting with, uh, you know, archivists and, and researchers there. Um, but, uh, but I had to do what I had to do. And, and thankfully I found a lot uh, more than I ever expected to online. Okay. Well, that's yeah. great. So one of the things when I was reading it, it was really hard to read, but not living at that time. Um, I have a little bit of Irish in my sort of genealogy, but there was this weird thing he talked about the the Nina the no Irish need apply. It was it was weird reading that because on one hand it was intense hatred towards of course the Catholics and the Irish, but at the same time the people in Boston were still hiring. It's it's a weird sort of thing why there was so much hatred, but at the same time there's a lot of people hiring like British who, or Bridget who was very successful. She was a grocer, a hairdresser and so on and so forth. So can you kind of talk about that weird sort of um, juxtaposition? Yeah, yeah, good point. And um, I found it interesting too. Um, you know, I guess I described that this, that this period of time when Bridget and Patrick came to, came to Boston <clears throat> was they were part of the initial waves of what was really the first large scale mass immigration into America. You know, we've had trickles of immigrants from other countries since the earliest days. You know, we were founded by colonizers, um, not founded by, but, you know, settled by. Um, uh, and, um, you know, in, in the 1800s, you see this massive, massive influx of Irish and Catholics because of the, the crumbling of their own country, because of the potato famine and the subsequent economic collapse. Um, so many cities that received these boatloads, shiploads of Irish freaked out. <laughs> like they had just never seen anything like this. America had never seen anything like this. Um, I think if they had been shiploads of British, maybe they would have been less freaked out. I think the Catholic thing was, um, uh, you, you know, uh, a hang up for many old school Protestant Boston families who, who were fearful of what it meant that so many Catholics were coming to this country and it triggered hysteria in some, in some quarters. Um, you know, when it comes to hiring, there were the Nina ads, as you said, the no Irish need apply. Um, at the same time, the, the Boston uh, families needed help and there, there weren't many people, women in particular, who were willing to take on those kind of jobs. So they ended up hiring Bridget's and, and, referring to them as their Bridgets or their Biddies, you know, using the term Bridget, Biddy and Maid interchangeably. Um, so that's how Bridget Murphy Kennedy got her foot in the door and started her, her life in America, just taking on the crappiest job that was available to her and, and dealing with the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the hardships of being just the help a servant. Um, and, but at the same time, displaying kind of this ambition and tenacity and this willingness to work hard and, and find a, a leg up 
which as he said, she did little by little. She worked as, at a hotel at some point, then she got a job as a hairdresser, um, and then later incredibly opened her own grocery store and became a small business owner at a time when that just didn't happen, especially with uh, you know a, a female proprietor um, who happened to be a widowed immigrant maid prior to that. So her, her ascent, I, I think, is truly remarkable, um, but, it, but it happens at a time when there's just that uh, incredible uh, period of, of hatred, you know, a, a political party, the Know Nothing Party, as they were collectively known, uh, created specifically to keep Catholics down and out, to, to enact laws, which is what they attempted to do, to prevent Catholics from becoming citizens, to prevent them from voting, prevent them from holding public office, to sort of control what they learned in the public schools. I mean, they were really um, oppressed during that time, which to me makes it even more fascinating that they just sort of fought through this. And you have examples of women like Bridget becoming a business owner and, and then a community leader. And then you see her son taking it from there and, and having his own influence uh, on his city as a, as a politician and, and businessman. So, yeah. There's, there's probably, a, I don't know how many, we'll just say quite a lot of books written about Joe Kennedy, of course, and JFK and Bobby Kennedy. Why do you think there aren't that many books maybe written about, or maybe there are, uh, written about Bridget or even PJ? Yeah, uh, I, I know mine's the first to go this deep. Um, you know, there have been others that have touched on this period. Uh, Lawrence Lemer has written about the Kennedys um, impressively. The Kennedy Women is one of his books. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin um, got started uh, uh, um, in exploring the Kennedy story, the early Kennedy story with her book, The Kennedys and the Fitzgeralds. But she focuses a little bit more on the... Um, on the, the Fitzgerald side than on the Kennedy side. She does introduce us to Bridget and Patrick, but she doesn't spend as much time. I think one reason for that, and one reason other books didn't go uh, deeply in that direction is because there's just not a lot known about them. I mean, I ran in, up against this time and time again in my own research. And in fact, at times thought, is this crazy trying to bring to life two, two people who we don't really know because they didn't lightly behind a diary or their letters or, 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 or even photographs. We don't know what they look like. Um, but I, but I became fixated on, on doing whatever it took to bring them to life because they had never been, their story had never been fully told before. You know, I, I, I felt like their story was missing from the Kennedy canon and that it added a lot of uh, context to the story of what that family became in future generations. Um, I'm just taking a quick look at some of the Q&A questions, and there is a question about the Fitzgerald lineage, um, and I, I, I touch on, on them, um, and I do explore the relationship between PJ and uh, Honey Fitz, John F. Fitzgerald, because they were contemporaries, peers as uh, state legislators and, and influential politicians during their day, and because they, you know, through their uh, their children, give us the family uh, that we know of today as the Kennedys. But I don't go deep into the Fitzgerald side. It's really a, a mainly an exploration of the Kennedy side. Okay. One of the other things towards the end of the book, it talks about PJ, and he sort of makes the jump from, um, we'll just say, saloon keeper to politics and liquor and politics in Boston. Why was PJ so successful and other people just weren't very successful in that lineage? Yeah, I think it's an interesting period of time because PJ was an example of a, um, you know, a small business owner who, again, kind of learned the ropes of running a small business from his mother, the grocery shop owner. Um, but he ran his shop at a time when there were many, many aggressive efforts to keep the, his kinds of businesses uh, down or put them out of business. Again, the influence of the, the Brahmin politicians of the day who hated the Irish. For the Irish, a, a saloon was a way to start a, start a, or their own business. You, you know, they weren't, they weren't, as we discussed earlier, getting hired widely in, in uh, sort of, you know, middle class type jobs. They were working at the bottom. The women as maids, the men as ditch diggers and laying the railroads. They were just grunts, truly. So to be able to open a small business and have some agency for yourself as PJ did when he opened his first saloon and then his next saloon and his next saloon was really a, a big step. And um, 
Uh, but but his success came as there were many laws passed year over year, some successful, some failed to shut down those businesses or make it really hard for those businesses. It's like I, de I describe how the Prohibition Party and the other forces of prohibition, which have been strong in this country since the very beginning, but through the 1800s, as you get Irish and Catholics coming and they, as we know, Irish, I'm Irish, they like to drink. So, so they wanted their pubs, but the Brahmins wanted to shut down the pubs. So they tried to enact a ban against per perpendicular drinking. Everybody had to be seated at a cafe table or, <clears throat> or uh, you, you, pubs had to serve food. They couldn't just serve liquor um, or they had to keep the front windows open. It was called the shade law. There couldn't be anything obstructing the view from outside. So that way the cops could walk past and look inside and keep track of who was doing what. Um, example after example after example of those kinds of efforts to make it harder for these businesses to succeed. <clears throat> In PJ's case, I think he was successful because uh, he started as a bartender. He learned how to listen. He learned how to uh, just be a gracious host. Um, and I describe how it's sort of how he conducted himself the rest of his life. You know, if you came into PJ's bar and you were down on your luck or needed a drink or a meal, he would help you with a drink or a meal. He might give you a few bucks. He might tell you where you could go to find a job or where you might go to find a place to live. He was always sort of making connections and fixing things and giving people a boost. And that same type of um, uh, concern for uh, those who were in need, uh, that's what helped him succeed as a politician as well. Um, I think he was genuinely concerned about other people, particularly those who had less than. Um, and you see some of that in subsequent generations of the Kennedys. Uh, I'd argue it kind of skips over Joe Kennedy, um, who was more concerned with just wealth and power and, and uh, getting his sons elected to, to, uh, to higher office. But PJ, I think, was just a, a good guy who was... Um, uh, learned the ropes and then and then continued to just work hard as a politician and a successful businessman to just give give other people a break, help them out. This is a bit of a piggyback off of PJ, but what would you say his his best advice or his lineage to his family? Is it politics or business or both? Especially with you know Joe Kennedy and John F. Kennedy, they little bits and pieces you could sort of see in what they did, but which do you think he gave to everybody? Yeah, that's a good one, because I, I do think it's both. Um, you know, I think he was a successful politician, although I describe how he got to a point where he realized he wasn't a good speech giver. He didn't love campaigning. Um, he did love he, the, the, the feeling of helping and making life better for his people, either his constituents or, in many cases, Irish immigrants like his parents. Um, but he, he didn't aspire to higher office. Uh, he got to a point where he realized that's not for me. I'm better working behind the scenes, um, which he did for many years. He ended up serving in appointed positions as, you know, com commissioner of wires and fire commissioner for a period of time. But he also, I described how he served for a long time on this initially secretive, and then it was exposed a group called the Board of Strategy. Um, uh, a handful of uh, Irish Democratic politicians who met regularly at the Quincy Hotel in Boston and got together to figure out, all right, who, which candidate do we like this upcoming election season for this, this position and that position? Which uh, person do we want to consider for some appointed role within city government? They kind of made the decisions for who ran the city once the Irish Democrats gained sort of more control. They were very outnumbered for many years. Uh, PJ first, was first elected to office in 1885, the same year that Boston elected its first Irish Catholic mayor. Um, so he was part of, the, he was there at the very beginning when the Irish Democrats were just breaking through. And it took a, a number of years, but along the way, not only did he achieve this, this political success, but he came, became a very successful businessman. Opened a bank with a couple of colleagues, Columbia, Sav Columbia Savings Bank. Uh, anyway, Columbia, call it. <clears throat> um, got into the coal business, got into real estate. He op at one point was a VP or uh, uh, an officer at a casket company. Um, 
And all the while he's running his uh, various liquor businesses. So he made a lot of money along the way. And in fact, Joe Kennedy, when he gets uh, goes to Harvard, because he's comes now from this successful family um, uh, and is able to, to go to Harvard, when he gets out, he gets into banking, he just doesn't want to get into politics, but he goes into banking and his first big job is at his father's bank. You know, he he's good at it. Um, and and uh, there's there, there's been much written about him in 1914 being praised as the youngest bank president in America. But it was daddy's bank. That little tidbit often gets forgotten. So I think to your question, Derek, he, you know, Joe and uh, uh, Joe's children, I think, all gained um, some political savvy and lessons from PJ. Um, but also um, some strong business lessons. Um, you know, if you look at Honeyfits, he was all politician. You know, he he was uh, he was a great campaigner and a great speech giver and, a, and an inspiring politician. So clearly, the family uh, learned a lot and gained a lot from him, his influence as a politician. But I think uh, they got it from both sides. PJ, the humble politician and the backroom ward boss, and then Honeyfits, the flamboyant. Uh, you know. The, guy who sang Sweet Adeline at a, at a pub at the drop of a hat. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see the two influences of Honey Fitz and PJ on both mm -hmm. Joe and the rest of the, the family. Okay. Do you think if uh, Bridget was born a male, mm -hmm. would her story become uh, a larger part of the Kennedy legacy? Absolutely. <laughs> no question in my mind. Um, and, and, and I think that's why I, I really worked hard to bring her to life as best I could, even with all the limits uh, I, I, I confronted on what's available ab about her life. I think if she was a dude, she, she would be praised. Uh, well, in fact, there's, here's an anecdote. JFK, I think, in time did appreciate his Irish heritage uh, uh, more so than his father. His father just wanted to be American, not Irish-American, not... Uh, you know, the grandson of immigrants, he was, he would say, I was born here. What does it take to be an American? JFK had developed an appreciation for his heritage and where he came from. But when he goes to Ireland, he visited a, a number of times over the years, but his final visit a few months before he was killed in, in 1963, he goes to New Ross, the town right down the street from, or up the road from where his father, great-grandfather was born and raised. Um, he gives a speech there on the on the piers uh, and, and um, gives a shout out to his great grandfather, the barrel maker, doesn't mention Bridget at all, which uh, to me is um, maybe not all that surprising, given the sort of male focus of that family. And and you could argue the misogyny that that is a, a through line. Um, but it's a missed opportunity to me because she was really the one who kept this family going. Um, and without her, it, there would be nothing, you know, Patrick, the barrel maker died 10 years after coming to America. Bridget's the one who kept it, kept it all together and, and made a success of herself and her son. Yeah. Okay. We'll start with some questions here. We're getting some good ones here. So uh, Linda's <laughs> asking about uh, your, your book in general, did any of the current, Kennedy's assist you at your work? Have they said anything about your current uh, book that you just published? Um, has there been any reception from them? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I reached out to as many current Kennedy uh, family members as I could find. Um, and some of them would take my calls. Some of them just gave me a cursory, you know, sorry, we can't help with that. But in general, like across the board, what I learned is the family as a whole, A, doesn't really know that much about their deep past mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe didn't want to reopen some, some, some doors going back that far. Um, so, uh, you know, I would talk, I, I had an interview with Rory Kennedy, uh, daughter of, uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy, um, Amanda Smith and Stephen Kennedy Smith, daughter's, uh, daughter and, and son of, uh, Gene Kennedy Smith. And the responses were, you know, this sounds like a great project. I wish you luck, but I don't know anything about that. We didn't talk about that as a family. Um, 
And similarly at the JFK Library, they were very helpful as best they could, but the, but they don't have a lot in their collection about Bridget and Patrick. I got access to everything they did have and about PJ, but there wasn't an emphasis on that on that part of the past. And then the last one I'll mention is uh, Maria Shriver, who I contacted and sent me a very nice note saying, I look forward to reading your book and learning more about my own family. Oh. And, so I think that's that's kind yep. of sums up how the family views this this part of their history is they they don't know and they're open to learning more but it just wasn't talked about so much. Okay, we have another question that's talking about um, the 1880s and the 1890s. It sounds like you uh, read a lot about it. Are there are some things you really like about the time period and in, in particular in America. Yeah, I think it was su such a transitional period, and I and I I think I'm drawn to those eras where where something shifts in a very large way um in the case of the group that i'm writing about here both the kennedys themselves but the broader group of irish immigrants and their descendants um something shifted dramatically uh, during the 1880s and 90s um you see that group of um uh irish catholics go from being the the underdog, the the despised newcomer, the uh, go back to where you came from, recipients of discrimination and hatred, to slowly working their way into, you know, call it the fabric of, of the American economy, you know, working their way up from these low level jobs, starting to serve roles as uh, as firefighters and 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 police officers, and the women serving incredibly, you know, during the Civil War, serving roles that they never could have uh, dreamed of of serving back in Ireland, you know, working as nurses, working as teachers, getting involved later in the suffrage movement, um, getting involved in in abolition uh, activities. Um, uh, they they found their agency here in, in America, I think, many of these women in particular, maybe more so than the men. But then you get into the 90, 1890s and you see the men starting to find their groove, again, in the case of Boston and the Irish Catholics, in politics, like PJ and Honeyfits. They were two among many, um, you know, sons of Irish immigrants who decided that's where they could have some success financially, economically, politically, and uh, and otherwise, and change that city. So I, I you see Boston change from a, uh, a city uh, where Irish are the newcomers to a city of, by, and for the Irish. They take over. Okay. We have a, a nice a question about Bridget and her daughters. Did any of them live to adulthood? Um, anything in their some stories that were remarkable as their mother, Bridget? Um, not as remarkable. They uh, one daughter, Joanne, worked at the store with Bridget for many years, um, and in fact was uh, uh, response partly responsible for helping Bridget buy the building where the grocery store existed, and then together they bought the building next to that, uh, took out a mortgage. So one daughter was was very deeply involved in that. <clears throat> Another daughter uh, worked as a seamstress for many years and worked in a mill, um, traveled a little bit around that that area of Boston. Another daughter with her husband moved uh, to New York and then back. There's just a little bit less known about them, um, you know, and, and because there's more known about PJ, who became a you know successful politician, I followed him more so than the daughters. Um, but um, <clears throat> I was going to say one other thing about the daughters, um, but they did they did live into adulthood. But I do describe too the hardships that they faced in their own way. Um, the three daughters had, um, uh, I, th I think, a total of twenty two children combined, nearly half of whom died in 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 childhood. Um, <clears throat> so, even though you see that family achieving. Uh, some measures of success, they still were uh, susceptible to the diseases of the, you know, the poor immigrant neighborhoods. And, and so Bridget's daughters lost uh, a, a number of their, their, their own children at, at a very young age, even as they lived in, into adulthood. You mentioned the Civil War a little bit. Uh, could you maybe go into how the Civil War affected the Irish in America, uh, specifically like the draft riots and the Know Nothing Party and things like that? Yeah, I do. I do uh, uh, spend one whole chapter on on the Civil War and how the Irish were involved and how it affected their sort of uh, evolution in in terms of uh, acclimating to America. 
um, on the one hand, <clears throat> many uh, uh, Irish immigrants uh, volunteered to fight um, and, and fought bravely. You, you know, there are many books out there. Tim, Timothy Egan's The Immortal Irishman is a wonderful book about Thomas Mayer, a you know, Civil War general for the Union, who uh, was a, a previously a, 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 you know, a, a so-called rebel back in Ireland fighting for Irish independence. Um, and so there were, I think, 150,000 Irish fought for the Union. Um, some fought for the South as well, but in large numbers, the Irish fought and, and fought hard. And, and I think that helped them overcome some of that anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic uh, attitude that they had previously faced because they served well during the Civil War. But then, as you, the questioner asks, uh, there's that asterisk about them, uh, as I describe it in the book, shooting themselves in the foot with the draft riots in New York. Um, you know, the many Irish men were angry that uh, that others could buy their way out of the draft. I think it was 300 bucks. They didn't have that money. Um, and, uh, and and many uh, African-American men were exempt and the Irish took their anger out on them. And it's a horrible episode in, in their history and in American history where, you know, gangs of Irish men went on a rampage in New York City and torch the uh the the uh the orphanage for, for for black children in new york city and lynched black men from lampposts and from trees um you know the numbers of dead vary but it you know hundreds if not more were killed during these riots so that's a it's a terrible stain on on the on the irish in general um uh, you know coming after they had kind of served well during the civil war and then and then uh served horribly in in that terrible episode okay we have a question that asks since boston and other places on the coast when they immigrated uh were very anti-catholic anti-irish were there any welcoming places in america that opened maybe irish a little bit better huh. you know um i think that that type of discrimination i came across the Irish facing in many places. Um, and I didn't find a, a single place where they were welcomed with open arms. Um, in fact, I found, you know, examples of rioting and discrimination in, in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, in Louisville, um, in Cincinnati. Um, uh, uh, but it's, it's interesting to me, this doesn't exactly answer the question, but it's interesting to me that the Irish mainly settled in cities. Um, you know, many of them came from rural Ireland. Uh, they came from farms. And when they got to America, there, were, there was a lot of encouragement from the Catholic Church, from this uh, newspaper that I quote from liberally, the Boston Pilot, which was kind of the voice of the Catholic Church, uh, mainly in Boston, but nationally as, as well, uh, goading the Irish immigrants to move west. You know, go find a farm for yourself. Go out to the, you know, the, the Midwest and 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 settle where you know you'll find a job. Don't stay here in Boston because you're going to die. <laughs> was kind of the the messaging. Too crowded, not enough jobs. You're not going to make it here. You might as well have stayed in Ireland. That was that was the advice that they were getting. Um, and it, and you know, and a lot of it was true. They did confront sort of these aggressive forces aligned against them. Um, but I think it's an interesting question. I'm sure there are pockets where they were welcomed and, and embraced, um, maybe not initially, but in time. But I think my point about them settling in cities is that in, instead of um, kind of uh, acclimating and just being absorbed into America, the Irish kind of resisted that. They said, no, we're going to stay together in this little cluster in this city, and we're going to make this city our own. You know, we're going to stick with our kind and help our people and, and uh, you know, have the, the city serve us, not the, the other way around. Um, and that's what happened in a lot of, in a lot of places. It, you know, Boston became an Irish city. It's probably, you know, still one of the most Irish uh, descendant cities in America um, because of that attitude of staying put and taking over instead of sort of blending in and, and acclimating and, and sort of giving up who they were. Okay. The heart of the book, in the beginning at least, is uh, Joseph and Patrick, or sorry, mm -hmm. Patrick and Bridget, when they get together, that first generation. Can you talk about the Irish county that they were from in Ireland and maybe the conditions that were there that made them want to kind of leave and come to America? 
Yeah, um, both Patrick and Bridget were from County Wexford, um, southeast uh, corner of the of the island uh, of Ireland. Um, they both grew up on small farms. Um, their their fathers uh, were tenant farmers who paid rent to an absentee English landlord. You know, I describe some of the conditions uh, of that time where Ireland was essentially owned by uh, England. I mean, it was a colony of England, had been conquered by England centuries before, um, and families who previously, you know, owned their own land now had to rent their land back from, from large landowners, many of whom lived elsewhere, or they had a local land agent who was uh, the, the, the rent collector. Um, so it was a hard life. It was a small, simple, you know, uh, almost peasant lifestyle for them. Um, you know, a couple of buildings that they all lived in, you know, once the kids grew older and raised their own families, they'd squeeze in together and then maybe the a sibling would move out and, into another nearby farm, but um, uh, pretty small and simple and, and very similar, Bridget and Patrick, uh, you know, being raised in this way. Uh, Patrick, interestingly, leaves home and starts working as a barrel maker in a nearby town. So he learns a little bit of a skill that gave him a leg up in America. Um but I, I find it interesting that in both cases, Bridget and Patrick, they were the first to decide, I'm out of here. Once the potato famine hit, which affected the West of Ireland worse than where Bridget and Patrick grew up. They were affected and they did lose their potato crops, um, but we know they didn't starve and they didn't lose the family farm like many people did. You know, a lot of farmers lost the farm because they couldn't pay the rent anymore. And so they were evicted and then they died or of starvation or disease, or if they were lucky, scrounged up enough money to buy a ticket to go to America or somewhere else. So it was a hard life. And if they had stayed, it would have stayed, remained hard for, for many decades to come. Uh, we have a question here. Could you maybe give a brief family tree from PJ to Joseph Kennedy? Yeah. Um, and there, and the, in the book, there is a family tree because I became a little obsessed with that you know, trying to figure out who, who the ancestors were and what the lineage is and how it tra traces down. So uh, PJ, um, hey, there we go. <laughs> Probably can't see it very well, but yeah, it's very, uh, oh boy. Let's see if I can get it, maybe. Well, you can tell I can't do the selfie because I uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Joseph there, but I could be wrong, but. Yeah, that's PJ and Mary. Uh, so PJ married Mary, Mary Augusta Hickey in 1887. Um, their uh, firstborn child was Joe, born in 1888. And then they had two more children, Loretta and Margaret. Um, they had a, a second son, Frank, who died in 1893, I believe. But yeah, PJ was Joe's father. Uh, PJ and Mary Augusta Hickey, his wife, were Joe's parents. Um, yeah, you know, grandparents of uh, JFK and RFK and the rest. Okay, uh, we have uh, time for one more question. And uh, somebody asked about uh, the, let's say in the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, there was a lot of influx of different uh, ethnic groups. Um, did the Irish impose any similar problems when say maybe the Irish or the, I'm sorry, the Italians or the Jewish, when they started to make their kind of mark in places like Boston, did they, not really return the favor, but did they maybe pass on some hostility or anything like that? I, I would say there's there was definitely some of that for sure, you know, and I th I think that's uh, true of um, many immigrant groups over time, you know, wanting to close the door on the next group that's trying to get in the door or pull up the ladder, as it were, um, uh, because yeah, the uh, the Irish. Um, were the first large scale group in in Boston and other cities, and then and then the Italians come, and then uh, Jews from Eastern Europe start to come to America too, um, and you know didn't always get along. And and I explore briefly uh, as well the uh, relationship between the Irish and and uh, black families moving north to Boston uh, after the Civil War, um, after emancipation, and they, they weren't gracious to, to those families either. So there, there's definitely tension that continued and, and persisted throughout uh, those next generations. Um, 
And yeah, the Irish, they're, they're known for being as discriminatory at times as, uh, as the know nothings and others were uh, to them. I don't explore it that deeply, but I, but I know it was definitely uh, some, something that, that was going on as they rose to power and others are trying to, uh, you know, follow suit and make, and make a life for themselves in America. Sad. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for uh, taking the time, Neil, to talk about your wonderful book here. So definitely go and get this. This is a wonderful book. Um, and uh, thanks again for taking time. Thank you for doing this, Derek. Thank you for the great questions, everyone. Thanks for joining okay. in. Um, please support the local bookseller. I know the link is there, so I hope you'll uh, pick up a copy yeah. from, from your local bookseller. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks again. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thanks.